but can you can you tell yourself uh, how many people have joined oh 27 i can see yeah. ah it's showing up numbers and also there's people watching live in the youtube that will not be counted here <clears throat> oh people are watching on youtube i see what what's the channel on youtube called send a special uh, uh, link Yeah, it says you're screen sharing live. That's right. Yeah. You're very exciting. Just giving choices, making it more convenient for people. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yes. Um, now it's fantastic work. Honestly, I'm, I'm so pleased. I like your photographs. That's really good. Oh, the, the, I mean, the one that <laughs> I finally created, you know what, I, I took it from uh, from the big wheel, you know, remember that, that the big wheel? I see. I went to the top of that with my camera, I kept going up and taking another picture. <laughs> That's really nice, really nice. Okay, Sam, I'll just give a brief introduction, then we can okay. start. In okay. Um, good morning. Welcome to um, Scottish uh, Head and Neck Summit. Uh, originally, it is designed for a registrar's training day. And still, we will give preference to those um, trainees. So other people will be uh, watching more on the uh, attendee as a kind of um, view only participants. We would like to take some questions as well, but more preference will be given to the uh, trainees from Scotland. And the pandemic has made a huge change in the way we are working and the way we are interacting. Um, but certainly, uh, I like the pandemic. It has opened up the world and it has taught us many lessons. Um, and I strongly believe education is the best tool which needs to be generalized and globalized. And that's why uh, we have um, made this program and generalized to the whole world. Uh, I'm very keen um, to propagate a head and neck uh, knowledge, particularly head and neck cancer and rehabilitation um, uh, to the world. Uh, and that's why we got uh, uh, fantastic speakers uh, all around um, day today. And the first speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Majumdar, is one of my eminent colleague and great uh, laryngologist uh, in the UK. And he, he has done, he has delivered many international lectures uh, around the globe um, and uh, Sam, it's over to you. And Sam will take uh, for 35 minutes. Uh, we do spend some five minutes for the questions. So you can use a Q&A channel uh, to write questions. It will come to you, come to us directly. You can also chat by yourself or we can pick up some questions from the chat as well. And once again, it is an educational uh, meeting and there is, I uh, really don't want any uh, hate uh, messages or inappropriate or, or abnormal uh, message uh, in this chat box or anything else, please. Thank you. Sam, over to you. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, is, <laughs> thanks for the generous, very generous comments. I have been very lucky to work with Jay for many, many years, and uh, I'm very privileged at this moment to work with him as a colleague too. It's an absolute privilege to talk to you guys. Now, I have prepared this uh, talk uh, for our trainees. Uh, so this is certainly not for a talk for the uh, masters. It's not a talk for a master class. So uh, I will take you through this in the ne next few minutes and hopefully share our experience with you too. Surgical anatomy and management of laryngotracheal stenosis. Uh, now, breath equals life. And it's very important to understand that. Just hold your breath and see how long you can hold it. You could work out that how important it is to you. From the first breath to the last, one needs to breathe to sustain life. And you will see this. as we grow. Now, from birth to adolescence, the length of the trachea doubles, the diameter triples, and cross-sectional area increases six-fold. And this is a very important thing to understand because as the body gets bigger, the metabolic rate goes up 
the energy demands goes up, our trachea gets bigger because we need more oxygen. We need to breathe. And this shows up when there is anything that reduces the diameter of the trachea. For trainees, it's important to have uh, take note of this slide. As the trachea narrows, if the trachea narrows, it's reflected very uh, exponentially, dramatically on the airflow. Say uh, uh, the airflow resistance goes up as the tracheal diameter goes down. So the and it is proportional, inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So you need a tiny bit of change in the tracheal diameter. There will be a exponential and very impressive change in the difficulty of airflow that one would experience. So when you look at the front of the neck, this is where your airway is. So laryngotracheobronchial airways is the area, area that we are concentrating on. There is also upper airway, as we know from the nose to the larynx and the mouth to the larynx. At the front of the neck, you got the structures which are protecting, which are protecting the trachea, the muscles, the strap muscles. And behind that, you got the lar larynx and the trachea. And at the bottom of the neck, you got the uh, bony structures where you are meeting in the sternum. And this area is quite uh, complex. And as you will see, as you look into it, <clears throat> you'll see as we go towards the sternum, as you go towards the sternum, uh, major vessels appear uh, on the sides of the trachea. Now on the side view, or the lateral view, you can see in this cartoon picture that you got nerves and arteries. The most important nerve, as you, you all know, is the vagus nerve and its branches, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. What's missing here in the cartoon picture, you can see that we don't show, we're not showing the esophagus just behind it. So whenever you're thinking about the trachea in the neck, please think about the nerve, recurrent laryngeal nerve, and the esophagus behind it. If you look at this picture on this other side, which is again a hand-drawn <coughs> cartoon picture, you'll see how the recurrent laryngeal nerve comes right up to the cricoid and goes posterolaterally to enter the, uh, the larynx. Now, when if you are considering doing any surgery of the cricoid, stay at the front and the anterior part and anterolateral part in the third of the anterior part. If you go, the, go towards the back, you will almost certainly damage the laryngeal, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. So when you look at this picture, you see the, how the recurrent laryngeal nerve continues down and the propensity of very major arteries out there. So if you are delving down behind the sternum, or if you're attempting to split the sternum, be aware where you might end up. So when you are pulling the trachea up, you have to be extremely careful and you have to fully understand the anatomy in this area. As we all know that recurrent laryngeal nerve arches around the uh, arch of the aorta, and the other side, it is round, it goes on the subclavian artery. Now variations exist, especially on the right side. You may see different variations, and don't forget the presence of the thyroid gland. When you look at these hand-drawn <coughs> pictures, the cotton pictures, you can see the length of the trachea and how it divides and the angles between them. So it's, one, it's important for one to understand the length of the trachea. Length of the trachea increases as, uh, as someone gets taller. In tall person also, the diameter of the trachea is wider. So taller you are, wider trachea that you have. And this is an important slide because when you are doing any form of resection of the trachea and you will come to the back, and you see the tracheal rings are incomplete, you will see the blood vessels are coming from the back. And in between the two, you have tracheolus muscle and the continuity inside is just the epithelium. It's one, one has to be very, very careful not to damage these areas that will damage the blood supply. 
and always remember the esophagus lying just behind. It is not difficult to make a hole in the esophagus while you're doing any procedures on the trachea, in the neck or further down. <clears throat> so when you look at the look at the thoracic anatomy, you see the uh, closeness of the trachea to the esophagus again, but the, as the arteries crosses over. The one important thing for you to remember here is you won't be going there on your own. You will be going there with the thoracic surgeons. If you if you need to get a bigger uh, pull on the trachea, this vein is something that needs to be ligated. Uh, so that's why you need your uh, thoracic surgeon. So most of the uh, surgery of tracheal stenosis that we deal with are cervical tracheal stenosis. Anything more than that, you must involve thoracic surgeons. Now, this slide is just to remind you, we, we all do tracheostomy. And be careful when you do tracheostomy, spare cartilage and maintain the geometry and the integrity of the trachea. One of the common causes of tracheostenosis is badly done tracheostomy many years before. So it's very important to remember that when you're doing a tracheostomy, uh, work out carefully, do you really need to take tracheal cartilage out? It's best if you didn't. Etiology and presentations. Now, there are, there are two areas that you need to look at. One is why did they have tracheal or laryngotracheal stenosis in children, in babies, in neonates? you'll see congenital causes are, the, are more common in terms of uh, laryngotracheal stenosis. However, when you look at the prevalence of that, it is not congenital causes that gives rise to laryngotracheal stenosis. You'll find that how the uh, larynx or trachea might have got damaged has caused laryngotracheal stenosis, especially if, if a baby has been in the neonatal unit for a long time and have been intubated. This talk is not about pediatrics, it's mostly we are concentrating on adults. But you'll see when you look at the congenital causes, you'll find uh, laryngomalacia uh, uh, is high up at 60%, then vocal fold paralysis, subglottic stenosis, and you can see that as the, as the percentage goes down, then comes the acquired variety, and I'll talk to you about the acquired variety uh, in a minute. So most patients, again, concentrating on the adults out here, will present with dyspnea, shortness of breath, shortness of breath on exertion. Some may come with uh, uh, problems of voice too at the same time, as some degree of hoarseness, depending on how much is was extent of involvement. Cough, throat clearance can be an issue too. Remember, if you are struggling to breathe and struggling to breathe for a long, long time, you might develop cough on the top of that because of the dryness effect of the harsh airflow through your trachea or through your larynx. Dysphagia really may be also associated. Tracheal stenosis is rare and potentially life-threatening. Clinical symptoms arise when the trachea or the laryngotracheal lumen is up to 50% obstructed. In the awkward side of the problem, you'll see prolonged intubation, tracheostomy. In adults, you'll see a small number of cases with granulomatosis, with polyangitis, and some cases where they had neoplasia and treatment with radiotherapy, et cetera, and surgery. The narrowing of the tracheal lumen is what uh, uh, determines the intensity and severity of symptoms. Not every tracheal stenosis needs surgery. So you can do forms of surgery when needed, depending on how much is the stenosis and what is the manifestation and the degree uh, of uh, severity of functional uh, issues associated with it. Teamwork is the key. Never go alone. 
you must not do this form of surgery just on your own. You need a good team of anesthetists and surgeons with you. Remember, you have to always put your patients first. So keep your patients at the center and make sure that you, are, you fully understand the need of the patient and the outcomes that the patient is, that your patient is looking for. Of the patient's factor, uh, please take note of coagulation disorders, short neck, obesity. Now, obesity, BMI over 30, uh, usually is, is associated with poor outcome and even mortality. Enlarged thyroid dysmus, infection of soft tissue of the neck, previous surgery. Remember, previous surgery is always uh, always add some uh, difficulties and even complications. History of previous tracheostomy even, and sometimes history of previous laryngotracheal resection. If a patient is needing high ventilatory support, that is more than uh, positive expiratory pressure, more than 10 centimeter of water, they usually have more complications. Now, it is important that you become familiar with certain uh, classifications. As you can see at the bottom, there are number of classifications. I have uh, pointed out McCaffrey, Meyer Corton, Lano, Netaville, Cohen, and European Laryngological Society's classifications, of which the two of the pictures that I put on, which is Cotton Meyer or Meyer Cotton, whichever way you like to like to call it, and McCaffrey are the two that I find very useful. Um, in the Cotton Meyer or Meyer Cotton, you see that the grade uh, of uh, laryngotracheal, subglottic, and uh, tracheal stenosis is graded about the obstruction in terms of the circum um, the area. Uh, now, if there is no obstruction, up to 50% obstruction falls in grade one, as opposed to grade three, where it's 71 to 99% obstruction. Now, this doesn't tell you about where exactly the obstruction is, which I find very useful if you look at the McCaffrey classification, where you can see the obstruction is at the level of subglottis then subglottis, more than one centimeter, subglottis and trachea, and all three levels, subglottis, trachea, and the glottis affected. Now, one important point here for you to know that you need to know the degree of stenosis as well as the length of stenosis, which is known as the stenotic segment. And the third thing, you must know what are the structures involved. Glottis, subglottis, trachea. So that needs to be very clearly identified. So here you can see some pictures of that. It's a, it's, it's a very tight stenosis here, as opposed to less stenotic um, uh, uh, trachea and subglottis. Uh, you can also see that this top picture Top left here is the congenital presentation as opposed to an awkward one, uh, one who had um, intubation for length of time. Um, you can see, and uh, this is a, a long old slide of a pediatric uh, subglottic stenosis. Uh, and you can see the difficulty here. You can see that tiny little aperture through which when the child is breathing. So in assessment and management, the history is crucial, especially when you're dealing with adults with long history of shortness of breath, progressively worsening. You need a very detailed history. Patient needs to be assessed very carefully and in detail with flexible laryngotracheoscopy, which we do in our uh, clinic and in our intervention suite. I prefer having a good investigation carried out with CT scan and a 3D 
uh, CT scan a model to show us uh, the, uh, the detail of these tenacities. Laryngotracheal bronchoscopy is gold standard. So it can be done uh, before you proceed, but it must be done for your understanding. Now, some of that, uh, the, the clues will come from a very good uh, or well-performed laryngotracheoscopy in the clinic too, which we do quite often. Pulmonary function test is very, very useful because some of the patients that you will see might actually come from respiratory physicians because they had been treated for chest problem for a long time. Some patients also have comorbidity, i.e. COPD, et cetera, in the past. One very important point to remember that stay focused on patient centeredness and be absolutely uh, careful with your informed consent because this form of surgery has associated, associated mortality. Now, as a rule of thumb, you'll find that the grade one to grade two of myocotton and cotton myoclassifications, you'll find that you might be able to manage most of them uh, with uh, little treatment or endoscopic treatment or endoscopic surgery with balloon dilations and CO2 laser division of stenotic segment. This works well when the stenotic segment is short, but not long stenotic segment or not uh, frequently, re frequently recurring cases. If the grade uh, is three to four, you'll find that an open surgery uh, and resection of the stenotic segment, cervical stenotic segment with, re with, uh, with anastomosis, i.e. reconstruction is the best way forward. So, uh, to summarize, what are the measures of success? Now, uh, to know what's the measure of success, you must know how to avoid what's not good. Poor selection of cases, poor selection of surgical intervention, poor perioperative care. So choose carefully, deliver precisely and attend constantly. By that, I mean, uh, you need to attend the patient from the time you met them and especially perioperatively very closely, that's when complications can really, really uh, bring in a serious harms. Now, it, I haven't got the uh, opportunity here to talk to you in detail of operating procedures, but I have mentioned here and highlighted uh, some books, etc., that you might be able to read and papers, uh, which would help you. Now, when you are contemplating surgery, go back to the classifications and work out the, the segment and involvement of the anatomical structure, i.e. the glottis, subglottis, larynx. If it involves glottis, subglottis, you are thinking about laryngotracheal resection and reconstruction as opposed to tracheal astenosis on its own. Take note of uh, previous uh, tracheostomy, because that will determine uh, what form of uh, surgery you can do to reconstruct the after resection of the stenotic segment. For all uh, cervical uh, stenosis, uh, resection, after resection, uh, you do an end-to-end -end anastomosis as described in, to, in this cartoon picture. You can use Vicryl. We often use PDS in our practice. Now, uh, you might find that once you've done your resection, and if, if, if the resection is up to four or five centimeter, that there is a big gap and you are, you are starting to panic whether you'd be able to pull the trachea distal and the proximal part together. Suprahavid release, well known as Montgomery, described by himself, release, is, uh, can give you three to, uh, two to three centimeter of length. But remember, this comes often with complications. And one on of the complications besides uh, bleeding, uh, intraoperatively and postoperatively, uh, is uh, difficulty swallowing. You can also do infrahyoid uh, release uh, described by Dado. Uh, you 
in this, you get up to 2.5 centimeter of length. We, we often use this technique to get uh, the length. You can also release the uh, uh, distal trachea uh, by going further down around it um, behind the sternum uh, manubrium. Sorry about this. <laughs> now, this is a, a good paper for you to read. It's come out quite recently. It, it shows you uh, that uh, the common causes of uh, tracheal stenosis uh, is post-intubation. So a lot of ITU patients, you probably see a massive surge of that after the pandemic, a few years after uh, uh, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, tracheostomy, as I said to you, is also an important uh, cause a badly done tracheostomy. So the, the series that they looked at and shows uh, 228 patients with 80% post-intubation. Laryngotracheal resection they described out here, and you can see the success rate is excellent. They have 98.7% success rate on after such surgery. So if you carefully uh, choose your patients and do it well, your success rate is very high. And this is a 2021 uh, paper uh, saying that how surgical techniques are ultimately improving outcomes, I would say patients' lives. This is another uh, paper from a group in Italy, and you got the details here if you want to go and read it. And he, here you see uh, laryngotracheal resection. In laryngotracheal resection, you, you involve the cricoid cartilage and you often have to do a, a vertical incision on the midline on the thyroid cartilage to create uh, the anastomosis, uh, to create the space where you do anastomosis. After resection, you can see here, the gap has been created. And you can see that both the lamina and on both sides, you can see the trachea has been anastomosed to lamina right and left side. This is one of our cases you see. Now you, we use a, <coughs> a, a total thyroidectomy incision, uh, like a collar incision and expose the trachea. Uh, here we have resected uh, the stenotic segment. You can see the uh, endotracheal tube at the back and we are measuring it is about three centimeter defect. So you identify the segment and you uh, you then resect it. Now, often we help, uh, we do an endotracheal um, examination first um, before uh, we proceed to opening the neck and we might dilate it at that point and, and pass the thin endotracheal tube, uh, which we often pass it on behalf of the um, anesthetist. And then once we have uh, done uh, this resection uh, and reconstruction is done by end-to-end -end anastomosis, as you can see that multiple sutures have been placed. One has to be extremely careful in the posterior lateral parts. And the success of anastomosis and prevention of restenosis is directly related to how you do your mucosal anastomosis. Do not make these uh, sutures too tight. And as you go posterior laterally, be very careful not to stitch in or put a suture around the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is uh, just almost complete. Uh, when we complete our, uh, our um, anastomosis, we fill in the uh, surgical defect with saline, get the patient's head down, uh, the, the head end of the bed down, and we get uh, our anesthetist to do Valsalva to see if there's any air leak. If there's any air leak, you see air bubbles coming up through the water and you can identify the point. It's almost like you do anastomosis of bowel. And then you can stitch that area. We put uh, tissue glue on the top of that and soft tissue from around on the top of that. We, we leave uh, um, 
a corrugated drain there, E8, and then close the wound with drains. Complications of uh, tracheal resections and reconstructions. Uh, <clears throat> the most devastating complication, which is the commonest cause of mortality, is anastomotic separation postoperatively. This is why one has to be very careful about how you how you attend the patient. Granulation, descents, restenosis are other complications. Non-anastomotic complications involve damage to the laryngeal nerve, uh, tracheal fistula, tracheal innominate fistula, laryngeal edema, dysphagia, wound infection. So to summarize and come uh, to conclude, uh, you have to absolutely make sure at the beginning, uh, do no harm. Never practice on your own. Always go with the full team with other surgeons with you, a good, well-trained anesthetist. We are very lucky about that, that we have a fantastic anesthetic service. Uh, and make sure that your patient knows all along that what is he or she going to get. You need to avoid the issues that causes complications and focus on what delivers better care. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Brilliant. Um, Sam, can you look at the Q&A session? There's uh, two questions. Uh, can, you, can you read it out to me? Because I can't see it. That's fine. Okay. Hi, Mr. Majumdar. Would you ever offer and try a Madden procedure after multiple of balloon dilatation in idiopathic subgothic stenosis before moving the open reconstruction? So do we offer this procedure? Uh, in our practice, uh, we, uh, for short segment tracheal uh, stenosis, uh, when we do not have a cause known, i.e. diapathic, the, uh, the biopsy, we always take a biopsy every time we go in. Uh, if it is recurrent, I, by recurrent, I mean someone is needing more than, uh, more than three um, endotracheal uh, procedure with uh, laser division and balloon dilation uh, within a year, uh, we consider, uh, nowadays, we consider uh, open surgery. Now, I must say that uh, I'm still learning and my learning has, uh, is getting better all the time. Um, but talking to uh, many of the eminent surgeons, i.e. Guri, Sandhu, etc., uh, nationally, uh, um, idiopathic um, stenosis uh, can only be uh, dilated so many times. And uh, so it's important that you start the conversation with your patients very early to say that after so many times, uh, you probably need this. And also if you start seeing uh, the, uh, it is actually going, getting more stenotic after um, more and more um, interventions of balloon dilation and laser division, et cetera. Does it answer your question? Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, second question is uh, from uh, Michael Hopkins. Do you routinely identify the recurrent laryngeal nerves in your tracheal resection and reanastomosis? I, you should not look out for the recurrent laryngeal nerve, if that is at all possible. Your uh, incision uh, must be um, within the uh, periosteal, perichondrial. Uh, so when you're doing your dissection, stay uh, subperichondrial. Uh, so you are avoiding that too. So if you look at the large series, which goes up to 300 plus, uh, and the works of Grillo and you know, Montgomery and all of the others, they always tend to avoid looking for it. However, however, this is the thing I point out to you. If you do not know where the recurrent laryngeal nerve is going to be, and if you don't see it when it's actually in front of you, that's where the problem is. 
and uh, and and you you see such things when you have trainees uh, with you. Uh, they, they they can't see it. They're not familiar with it. And uh, so anatomy is pretty fixed. There are very small variations and less than one percent variations in the positions of recurrent laryngeal nerve, not at the tracheoesophageal groove, but at the point they they come turn back. So that's where the variation is. Uh, so no, I don't. I do not go looking out for the recurrent laryngeal nerve. I don't know what uh, what would be your answer. And I work with Mr. Manik twice. I don't think he looks out for it either. Yeah, absolutely correct, um, Sam. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't really look for it, but I know where it is. Uh, yeah, you must know. <laughs> you have to be careful, especially when Sam said the push through uh, lateral part. Uh, where the tracheoesophageal groove, uh, particularly on the left side, you have to be very careful while suturing. You don't want to uh, take a bite and strangle the nail as well. That's the tiger territory. That's the tiger territory. Do not make mistakes out there. And don't think that if you put in a, a endotracheal tube, that will has a, a that will that will have an alarm and tell you that when you are about to cut it, uh, that's going to save you. That's not going to work. Brilliant. <laughs> and use one of those tubes. Uh, but it's not going to help you. Question from uh, Victoria, it's our trainee. How long does the patient remain intubated for post-operatively? Uh, our patients nowadays don't remain intubated anymore. Uh, in the uh, early days, we I think, Jay, uh, we had one patient and then we moved on. Uh, so yeah, our patients go uh, to high dependency unit. And the reason is very simple because we don't have ENT wards anymore. We used to have ENT wards where the front bay used to be our high dependency unit. That has been disintegrated nationally, uh, thanks to National Health Service and others and the managers. So otherwise, we uh, we are. I think that you can keep your patients with you if we have one to a, one nursing care available overnight, who can monitor their breathing. It's Good. very important. And I didn't talk to you about the position of the neck. We like to have the neck slightly flexed and we tell them not to extend their neck. Uh, and and uh, we have started also sending them home, um, discharging them with a soft collar. So that stops that movement. So your answer to your question, uh, no, we don't send them to intensive care unit with it intubated. That doesn't happen anymore. And that's the practice of almost everyone I know. Uh, absolutely. And uh, after the uh, reconstruction or suturing, at the end of the procedure, we uh, use a fiber optic endoscope which yes. we through the yes. interface yes. and we assess the anastomotic site uh, in, with the anesthetist. If both are happy, we extubate on the table. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, there's uh, four more questions, uh, from one from Dylan Shetty. Is cotton Mayer's classification applied to subglottic stenosis or to the tracheal stenosis also? The cotton wire uh, classification was created for uh, subglottic stenosis. So the, that's the reason I put six different types of uh, classifications out there. Uh, it, I mean, to get a, get a good understanding of what you're dealing with, you need to spend about five, 600 hours of reading and studying. So I would strongly suggest that you read what I put on the slides, the McCaffrey and Lano and all the other classifications. The answer to your question, no, it doesn't. It's subglottic. And so an answer for your FRCS, if you're meeting me as, a, as your examiner, yes, uh, it's, it's subglottic. So if I ask you what other classifications do you have, I, I would be expecting you to know how to look at the trachea too and classify it. And that's why McCaffrey is very important. It tells you where exactly, what is the site, subsite, and is there more than one subsite? So if you look at Lano, Lano talked about three subsites, the glottis, subglottis, and trachea. McCaffrey has kind of combined it together. There's, so answer to your question is no. And, and I would request you to please look at all the classifications because it's important not to memorize, but to, to do the job. Sorry, I just took, to, took too, much, too much time. The next question is regarding tracheal stenosis, what is the maximum length of the tracheal stenosis that we can manage with 
resection and anastomosis? That's a very good question. It's a, it's a very good question, but if you, it depends who you're talking to. If you talk to, uh, talk to, uh, you know, my guru, you know, like, or, or my my friend, philosopher and guide, Guri Sandhu, you uh, will probably say five centimeters is fine. You'll just do that. A thoracic surgeon will probably do much more, depending on how far you are going to go. Uh, so up to, I would say up to five centimeter, we could quite easily manage uh, with with with. Uh, release up in above and below in the neck. I don't go into the uh, chest uh, to operate uh, because we don't have thoracic surgery support, but thoracic surgeons can um, and do a lot more of that um, because you see in the, the part in the chest uh, is uh, quite a lot more, more mobile. Good. One more question. Uh, do you single stage or two stage uh, LTR? Uh, <clears throat> uh, I would prefer to do, uh, when I did my pediatrics, I trained in Sheffield. We always did single single stage those days. And all my pediatric uh, colleagues that I know, they nowadays do single stage. You may have to in complex cases do uh, uh, two stage. And if you talk to um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, Haytham and others are our uh, local uh, experts or our GOS colleagues, Michelle, etc. Uh, you will find that uh, most of these procedures, especially in pediatrics, are done that way. I, I don't do pediatrics anymore, pediatric laryngotracheal stenosis. We just concentrate on the adults. So in adults, for me, it would be a single stage. And I would avoid any form of tracheostomy. Tracheostomy is an absolute no-no. So if you, you remember that, because that is the problem that eventually causes you tracheostenosis. So remember trache, you have to absolutely make sure that it's when possible and if possible, you're not doing, uh, doing anything twice. Brilliant. A question from uh, Leon Hamilton, our trainee. Is there, uh, is there less risk from percutaneous tracheostomy for stenosis in the future? It's a really good question. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't quite follow it. Is there a less risk from percutaneous trachea for stenosis in future? Oh, thanks, Leon. Uh, good, to, good to have a question from you too. Uh, uh, I, I, I think the risk is less. I personally think, uh, but you know, I can say these things that they are, you know, coming to the almost at the end of my career uh, because. Uh, you know, I'm not worried if anyone else is doing tracheostomy. But the only problem we have is not doing tracheostomy is a huge amount of uh, experience which will go away from our ear, nose and throat trainees and future surgeons. Uh, if you do a tracheostomy carefully, carefully, so if you do compare carefully, there is now no problem. So I, I, I have another talk that I gave some time ago. So if you do a carefully, careful tracheostomy and compare with complications with parcutaneous in terms of the outcome of stenosis, there's no difference. And if you look at the Manchester study, uh, I, uh, I can personally share it with you, some of my slides, there's no difference. But if you do, if you look at uh, tracheostomy done, uh, where people have taken large parts of tracheal cartilage out, made big holes, etc. There's no comparison. Parcutaneous would be 100 times better. So the answer to your question, like to like carefully done tracheostomy. Uh, uh, tracheostomy when it's done reversible a short term just to get the to secure airway. There is no difference in the long term. Of course, it's more surgery. But in terms of outcome of stenosis, no difference. Brilliant. I think that's we have answered all the questions. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Good luck and have a wonderful day. I'll join in as, 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 a, <laughs> as an attendee now. Thank you. Yes. So how do I get out? Just switch off, leave. Yeah, you don't have to leave, you can stay there. Yeah. Good. Um, Oh, Panas. 
Now we have a uh, morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Anas. Um, he's one of my um, colleague uh, from Scotland. Uh, he, he mainly practices head and neck uh, cancer. He is fellowship in USA and he's one of the fantastic uh, speaker. And he's going to, he's kindly actually, he's, he's, he's online, but he has recorded. So I'm going to play that. Um, but he's available for your questions as well. Good morning, Jai. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for asking me to talk uh, on today's uh, study day. Uh, my topic will be on advanced laryngeal cancer. I'm Panus Makopoulos, I'm a consultant, ENT, head and neck surgeon in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. So, obviously, a pretty uh, big topic, but um, I'll focus on a few areas here, uh, anatomical considerations, classification, landmark trials that have affected our uh, treatment uh, reg uh, regimens, uh, guidelines that we use here in the UK, and uh, things that we should be taking into account when selecting patients for treatment. Anatomical considerations. Um, so uh, the laryngeal sites and subsites, the supraglottis, the glottis, and the subglottis. Uh, the supraglottis has the infra and the suprahyoid epiglottis. They are epiglottic folds, the arytenoids, and the uh, and the ventricular bands. The glottis has the true and the right, uh, the true right and left uh, vocal cord, including the anterior commissure. The subglottis has no uh, subsites. Laryngeal SECs predominantly affect the glottis, followed by the supraglottis. Pre, the preepiglottic space and the paralaryngeal spaces are quite important, especially when uh, considering uh, tumor spread patterns. The preepiglottic space is a potential space immediately in front of the epiglottis. It's bound by the uh, hyoepiglottic uh, uh, ligament superiorly, the thyrohyoid membrane, the lamina of the thyroid cartilage anteriorly, the thyroepiglottic ligament inferiorly. This is a potential space which is made out of uh, adipose tissue and is devoid of any lymph nodes. The preepiglottic space is quite oftenly, uh, oftenly referred as the periepiglottic space because um, it extends slightly beyond the lateral margins of the epiglottis and it's often referred to as being a horseshoe shape. What's important to know is that there are fenestrations on the base of the of the epiglottis at the infrahyoid epiglottis that can lead directly to tumor to tumor spread into the preepiglottic space. The paraglottic space is a potential space uh, bound uh, by the thyroid cartilage and the uh, thyro uh, the cricothyroid membrane laterally. Medially is bound by the quadrangular membrane and the conus elasticus. And posteriorly, you have the piriform sinus, the piriform fossae, and posteriorly, uh, the paraglottic space extends to the cricothyroid joint. The paraglottic space is made of primar primarily, again, of adipose tissue, and also contains the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Transglottic tumors, as defined, are as, as tumors that uh, encroach on both the glottis and the supraglottis, with or without subglottic component, and quite often the site of origin is unclear. These tumors spread usually through the paraglottic space. The barriers to tumor spread are the quadrangular membrane, the conus elasticus, the thyroid membrane, and, um, and the broil tendon. Broil tendon has been slightly controversial because originally it was thought to be uh, uh, it was thought to be a, a site of tumor spread. Uh, broil tendon is defined as the insertion of the, vocal, the vocalis muscle to the thyroid cartilage, and this is an area that is absent of any perichondrium. However, recently, uh, recent studies by Kirchner's group has shown that uh, there's, this is actually a strong barrier to spread uh, of tumors, especially in the absence of any significant supraglottic or subglottic involvement. So enough about anatomy, let's talk a little bit about classification. 
the eighth classification system hasn't really uh, changed compared to the seventh when we're talking about a glottic, uh, superglottic, and subglottic cancer. So locally advanced is defined as T3+, plus, T3, T4, A, T4, B, T3 in the supraglottis and the glottis, um, and also the subglottis involves fixation of the cord, of the cord, at least uh, one cord, obviously. Uh, the supraglottis and the glottis, uh, T3, is also involve the, uh, the, uh, the, par the, the pre-epiglottic and the paraglottic spaces with minor inner... Uh, uh, minor inner cortex thyroid cartilage erosion. Uh, T4A tumors, on the contrary, uh, involve uh, uh, involve uh, the entire uh, or the entire depth of the cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, and also involve uh, involve uh, issues beyond the larynx. T4B is defined as uh, locally advanced um, unresectable tumors. Uh, invading the prevertebral space, the mediastinal structures, or in case uh, the carotid artery. So let's talk now about uh, some of the landmark trials that have been around and have affected our treatment uh, uh, decision making over the last 20, 30 years. The two uh, major trials I would expect uh, our registrars to be aware of when taking their FRCS exam is the Veteran Affairs the Laryngeal Cancer um, Study Group, published in 1991, and the, uh, the RTOG 9111 uh, trial published in 2003. Both of these papers were uh, published at the New England Journal of Medicine. So the first trial is a trial that we all uh, like to tear apart, but it's a very important trial. This is the trial that, um, that tested the standard of care at the time, which was total laryngectomy and post-operative post irradiation versus induction chemotherapy and radiotherapy in an attempt to, uh, to promote organ preservation in laryngeal cancer tumors. Both arms showed um, similar two-year overall survival at 68%, and the chemoradiotherapy arm also shown uh, overall uh, larynx preservation rate at 68%. This percentage was much lower for, uh, for cancers that were staged as T4 compared to cancers that were staged as T1, T3. And this is actually one of the criticisms of the study that um, although defined as advanced laryngeal cancer, uh, these, uh, these, these, these patients were, were, were classified as advanced based on their nodal status, not, as their, uh, uh, not, not based on their um, tumor status. So there, there were quite a, quite a few patients, 9% of patients with only T1, T2 uh, cancers, and only 9%, about 1 in 10 patients, had uh, cartilage invasion. In addition to that, 44 patients had mobile cords. So you could, uh, you could argue that all of these patients, uh, they were vast, not all, all of these patients were actually overtreated with either total laryngectomy or um, chemo irradiation. It's also... Um, uh, important in these studies that all the two-year disease-free survival was similar, the five to, um, to six-year uh, disease survival was quite different. Then uh, 12 years later, the uh, RTOG 9111 study was published. Um, this study um, compared the non-surgical arm of the laryngeal um, uh, veteran affairs study, which was um, induction chemo radiotherapy, um, induction chemo and radiotherapy versus concurrent chemo radiotherapy versus radiotherapy alone. So this study uh, mainly looked at uh, the timing of adding chemotherapy and also whether adding chemotherapy uh, would make any difference compared to radiotherapy alone. The two-year laryngeal preservation rates were very similar. Um, significantly higher in the concurrent chemo radiotherapy uh, group compared to induction chemo and also radiotherapy. The five-year overall survival rates were, uh, were, were exactly the same more or less in all three groups, uh, but as expected uh, there was more toxic uh, effects of chemotherapy when that was used either as concurrent or uh, later on uh, as part of the induction chemo and radiotherapy regime compared to radiotherapy alone. And these two studies have affected treatment paradigms uh, throughout the world. This is a paper from the U.S. in the mid-2000s, um, mid showing um, uh, 
um, uh, uh, trends in um, trends in um, in patterns of care um, from the mid 90s to the early 2000s. As you can see here, radiation and chemotherapy was increasing. Surgery alone or surgery with the radiation was decreasing. The long-term uh, results of the RTOG 9111 were published uh, 10 years later in 2013 in JCO. Um, the median fall-up increased from 3.8 to 10.8 years. Um, and as you can see here, um, laryngeal preservation was again found to be superior in the concurrent chemotherapy group. But uh, a new parameter, a new uh, outcome measure that they uh, introduced uh, uh, was found to be similar. And this new outcome measure was laryngectomy-free survival, which means uh, being alive, as, as the name implies, being alive with uh, without a laryngectomy. Again, overall survival was the same among three groups. Local original control was better in the concurrent chemotherapy group. But what was very important about this study is that it shown that there were, uh, there were quite a significant amount of deaths uh, at 10 years uh, caused by non-cancer causes in the uh, concurrent chemotherapy group. And um, so overall, this study has shown that uh, adding chemotherapy can make you uh, preserve your larynx for longer. However, uh, you could die from other causes. And this has been speculated to be the case with uh, patients dying from uh, non-respiration or having a poorly functioning larynx. So let's uh, look at our guidelines here uh, in the UK. Uh, you probably all aware of uh, this document, the BANO uh, guidelines published in 2016, something that we use in all uh, MDTs throughout the country. So I'm just gonna focus on T3 glottis. Most patients with T2B or T3 glottis uh, should be suitable for non-surgical larynx preservation therapy. Chemoradiotherapy should be the standard of care TLM or open partial surgical procedures should be used in selecting case, selected cases and in areas of um, availability of appropriate surgical expertise. Elective treatment of the neck should involve levels two to four in, um, in clinically negative uh, disease. And if you have no positive disease, uh, level five and level one could be considered. With uh, supraglottis, uh, Pretty much a similar approach, uh, concurrent chemotherapy, the standard of care, TLM or open surgical procedures uh, uh, could also be considered in selected cases. Levels 2 to 4 bilaterally and clinically uh, know the negative disease, and levels 2 to 5 should be uh, considered the, uh, at least on the involved site. The neck should be managed as per the pet neck clinical trial results. That means that N2 or N3 neck disease should be operated only if the post-treatment PET CT um, uh, is, is negative. So, excuse me, if it's positive. For larynx, uh, again, larynx preservation with concurrent chemotherapy therapy should be considered unless there's tumor invasion through the thyroid cartilage into the soft tissues of the neck in which cases total laryngectomy should be offered, as the outcomes are much better. Elective treatment levels two to four, five and six should be, uh, should be considered bilaterally. So these are our guidelines um, that we use here in the UK and uh, that are followed in um, most places around the world. Patient selection is very, very important. Um, Treatment decision factors that I tend to take into account and most people do in their NDTs as well uh, are the following. Functional assessment, performance score using the ECOG or the Karnofsky scores uh, are very important. Uh, I tend to, um, to, to see my patient at least uh, twice, sometimes even three times prior to surgery, uh, whether that's on the ward, whether that's uh, uh, in the outpatient uh, setting or now as we as we tend to do over the telephone. Uh, I would like to know what they can do and what I feel they will be able to do after surgery or after um, a long course of uh, radiotherapy. Uh, I quite often speak to the families um, or occasionally have spoken in the past to their GPs 
uh, if, I, if, they, if they have no uh, immediate family that they would like me to speak to. Uh, patient factors are quite important, especially comorbidity scores um, using the ASA classification system that we use uh, preoperatively or the Charlson comorbidity index ACE27 questionnaires that are used in the academic uh, setting. Nutritional status is of prime importance. You want to know what their albumin is, what their BMI is, um, how much they can swallow. Um, physiological, so excuse me, psychological assessment is also extremely important. You know, you want to know what their cognitive function is. Uh, is there any are there any mental uh, disorders that are underlying? Uh, the, uh, is there any uh, evidence of, uh, of, substance, of substance abuse? Are they heavy drinkers, heavy smokers? Uh, all that stuff is extremely important. And uh, there's been recently a few papers out there uh, to show that head and neck cancer patients are quite frail compared to patients with other malignancies. This is a paper from uh, the Netherlands. Another paper uh, from the Danish database has shown that uh, patients with head and neck cancer with two or more uh, significant comorbidities, whether that's uh, ischemic heart disease, liver failure, respiratory failure, um, drop their survival, their overall survivor by 50%. And also what's important to know is that now we're seeing a lot of elderly uh, people with head and neck cancer. This wasn't the case when the, all these studies such as the VA larynx, tri larynx trial, trial or the RTOG 9111 that I previously mentioned were published. You look at people's uh, uh, people's uh, median, sorry, population, uh, study population's median age being in the mid uh, to, to, to late 50s. Uh, quite often in, in our clinics, we see patients in their 70s or sometimes in their in their um, early 80s with uh, laryngeal cancer. Tumor factors extremely important, um, whether that's uh, staging or uh, extent of resection. So um, I think it's quite important to know whether you have a pharyngeal involvement because this will determine the amount of surgery you have to do. Um, you might have to do a partial pharyngectomy or a total pharyngectomy with a, with a circumferential defect that will require reconstruction. Um, and uh, also that will have uh, 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 implications to a non-surgical um, uh, options that the patient might follow. For example, a patient with uh, significant uh, hypopharyngeal, hypopharyngeal involvement is very likely to need a gastrostomy um, uh, a tube for a nutritional supplementation throughout their organ, organ preservation uh, um, treatment option. I also find uh, that the um, um, that previous radiotherapy does make a big difference uh, to your uh, resection, whether that's resection of the primary, reconstructive options, and also management of the neck. Uh, as we all know, patients with, uh, with uh, undergoing salvage total laryngectomy have a much higher chance of fistulization, neopharyngeal stenosis, and perioperative wound complications. Um, and a study that I would expect our registrars to know for their exams in 2014, a study led by Vin Polari um, has shown in a, in a, in a systematic uh, review that the, the fistula rate reduces by about 37% when a free or pedicle flap is used for reconstruction. The extent of the neck dissection in the salvage laryngectomy setting has also been uh, questioned uh, in the past. Uh, uh, we, we did publish uh, some, data, some data from Edinburgh when I was a registrar there, um, and there's subsequently been a, a, a systematic review on the topic showing that the occult nodal positivity rate is only about 11%, and that uh, positivity rate drops even further in the contralateral neck. So somebody could argue that you don't need to do the uh, neck dissection in the salvage laryngectomy setting because the neck has been previously treated uh, by uh, radiation. And these are important things to keep in mind overall. Um, I assessed patients with, uh, with a CT neck um, and then thorax with contrast. 
I personally don't find uh, MRI particularly helpful uh, unless I, uh, I think there's some mucosal involvement of the base of tongue uh, or there's any debate or any doubt about whether the cartilage uh, has been involved um, in the larynx, the thyroid cartilage. In addition to this, um, MRIs are not, uh, well, a radiologist that are had an, had an entity sometimes uh, uh, moan about MRIs because they're not as readily available as CTs. But there are other advantages with MRIs. Um, you don't have that dental artifact, which is normally not a problem when you're looking at, at axial imaging at the level of the larynx. An endoscopy under general anesthetic is uh, of vital importance, and I think all surgeons considering surgery should be doing panendoscopy themselves. Um, you want to look at the base of tongue, you want to look at the pharynx, um, and uh, you want to be able to have an idea whether you're going to need a flap uh, as onlay or as, uh, as inlay uh, to, to facilitate your closure. Uh, also, if the base of tongue is involved, uh, you might have to consider a totoglossectomy, which is a significant operation with, uh, uh, with very um, uh, increased morbidity. Uh, Preoperative pre pre assessment, uh, I always get patients uh, seen in the pre-op clinic, uh, uh, even if they, uh, if they have no previous medical history of significance. Uh, quite often I'll ask for neck or pulmonary function tests. Pulmonary function tests are extremely important if you're considering partial orbectomy approach for patients. I always get patients seen by dietitians and salt uh, speech and language therapy uh, colleagues. Um, I think it's very important to know what kind of things they swallow, uh, what their swallow is their swallow safe, um, uh, because these are important decision um, decision points that you have to make when you decide to. Um, Go ahead with radical treatment, uh, either surgical or uh, or radiotherapy. Patients are having difficulty swallowing. That means the larynx is not working. So uh, if you radiate their larynx and their pharynx, um, you're not going to make those symptoms any better. So you might want to um, either avoid doing this by doing a, a, an upfront laryngectomy, or consider um, a, a gastrostomy tube for nutritional supplementation throughout their treatment. So now I'd like to speak about um, three cases that I've been dealing with, that I've dealt with over the last uh, six months here in Aberdeen. Uh, first patient is, um, they're all T4A cancers, but I just want to show how, how some of them behave so differently. Uh, it's just a snapshot. Um, uh, it's all anecdotal evidence, obviously. Uh, so the first case is a, is a 63 year old lady came, a lady came in with hoarseness. Uh, she she's a smoker and presented with a fixed right uh, focal cord submucosal um, uh, transglottic mass was identified on her CT she had biopsies and you can see here a thyroid cartilage erosion on the right side she underwent uh, total laryngectomy lateral neck sections uh, postoperative irradiation and she's doing very well she went home and um, on day 12 postoperatively and she did that absolutely fantastic like you would expect a primary total laryngectomy patient to do. Unlike this gentleman here I presented to the to the clinic uh, back in November uh, with uh, with an exophytic tumor, uh, a fixed uh, left vocal cord mass uh, and uh, within uh, two weeks uh, he presented to A&E uh, with acute airway obstruction, well, acute uh, subacute airway obstruction. Um, he underwent uh, deep bulking in theater. Uh, you can see here a hand sac and tube was inserted using, uh, we used cold steel techniques and suction diathermy. Um, this, is, he, this is his pre deep bulking CT showing an extensive uh, laryngeal uh, tumor destroying the thyroid cartilage, invading the straps and also the thyroid gland. Um, so he opted for a total laryngectomy with lateral neck dissections. Uh, he had a left sided um, um, uh, modified radial neck dissection. Um, and um, he didn't do well. Uh, within uh, two months, uh, he presented with uh, an earlier occurrence, 
uh, coming from uh, the base of the thing all the way down to the stoma and encasing his carotid here on the left, going down to the mediastinum. Unfortunately, he passed away within three months of his laryngectomy, so a completely different picture uh, compared to the previous patient. And this, uh, this, uh, this, this kind of uh, presentation takes me back to the days where uh, people used to say, if you do a tracheostomy during a laryngectomy, prior to doing a laryngectomy, you're, you're risking the chance of seeding. Um, this guy was uh, didn't have a tracheostomy. His tumor came out with clear margins, uh, but his biology was so aggressive that this tumor came back uh, um, with vengeance, and unfortunately, he passed away three months uh, later. This is another gentleman, a uh, 70 year old uh, uh, ex distant smoker, uh, seen in with laryngeal dysplasia for many years. Uh, he came in with worsening hoarseness. Uh, he had a fixed uh, right vocal cord, uh, biopsy confirmed from squamous cell carcinoma. This is his uh, CT here, extensive uh, laryngeal destruction. And he was uh, offered a um, total laryngectomy, but he refused it. Um, so instead, he had radiotherapy. He wasn't fit for chemotherapy. Um, and and um, on, on his first week of radiotherapy, he required a, a tracheostomy because things got swollen. And you would expect that this man wouldn't do very well. But now he's uh, four months down the line. I uh, saw him in clinic the other week. He's decannulated and he's swelling absolutely fine. Uh, so again, another picture, uh, another scenario that shows that uh, Patient wishes uh, sometimes take you to places that uh, you don't expect uh, to go. Uh, and all of these are T4As, but their outcomes are very, very different. Um, so there, there's definitely uh, limitations in the, in the staging system. Uh, I'd like to close now with, um, with a paper from, uh, I came across uh, in Head and Neck recently. Uh, it's from Tata Memorial in India. Um, I really like this paper, um, not, not mainly for the results and their, and their findings. It's only 100, patient, uh, 100 patients uh, with uh, uh, undergoing, the, um, undergoing uh, organ preservation uh, protocols for advanced laryngeal and hypopharyngeal cancer. But what I really enjoyed was uh, that they brought in uh, the concept of a new uh, outcome measure. They brought in the concept of functional laryngectomy free survival. And uh, this is a larynx functionality assessed at each follow up with a speech language uh, therapist using uh, methods such as fees or more modified barium swallows or video fluoroscopy. Um, and to me, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a much better outcome than uh, disease-specific survival or laryngectomy preservation rates when you're going to end up 10 years down the line from microaspiration. To me, this is a, a composite endpoint with, uh, that, that will provide uh, uh, an idea of what the overall impact on these patients' quality of life and meaningful organ preservation um, treatment options can be. Um, and I'd like to thank you all uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I'm more than happy and be delighted to take your questions. Thank you all. Brilliant, Panas. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Very honest uh, and the realistic of uh, advanced uh, head and neck cancer, particularly larynx. I uh, think um, there are questions. Um, uh, can you able to see the panel? Yeah, yeah I can see it. Uh, uh, so the first question, how do you decide about neck dissection for N0 neck for transglottic cancers? So that was uh, actually answered during the presentation. I think the question came in quite early. So um, if it's a primary uh, laryngectomy, then uh, you have to do bilateral nets, uh, especially when the superglottis is involved. I think that's the standard of care, levels two to four uh, for n not disease. I personally do a little bit of five as well, because I go posteriorly on the SEM and I take a little bit of anterior level five. 
and of course level six, uh, the partner tracheal and partracheal uh, areas which are essentially in your field. Uh, for the salvage setting, as mentioned earlier, uh, you could consider uh, not doing the contralateral side uh, because that side has been treated before. Unless you need um, access for a flap from that side, then might as well do it. Um, but uh, when you, you know, when you mobilize the, the larynx, you you almost have to do anterior levels two to three to four, two, two to four. So um, definitely, by so the, to answer for primary disease. Definitely prior bilateral for a salvage disease, you could consider unilateral uh, nasal sections. Does that answer the question? So, so the second question, how long you will recommend follow-up after total laryngectomy for advanced laryngeal cancer and how long for possible associated aerodigestive uh, tumors, metasynchronous? So the guidelines say five years, um, but again, you're right. Uh, sometimes these patients uh, come back with lung cancers, uh, hemoptysis, and uh, esophageal cancers, uh, metasynchronous tumors. Um, for us well, here in Aberdeen, I think most units in the UK, uh, the head and neck surgeons is five years, and then they stay under speech and language therapy follow-up. So if there's any concerns, uh, Patients have uh, open access to the clinic, either, the, either themselves directly or through the speech and language therapy uh, colleagues. So I think five years a minimum, but uh, um, after that, they have open access. So they can always come back anytime. And the last question is how do you decide on management of the thyroid gland when operating for T4 lesions? That's interesting. Um, I personally tend to do the unilateral lobe, well, the ipsilateral lobe to the cancer always, uh, but it's, the pickup rate is pretty low, actually. The pickup rate is less than 20%, less than 10%, depending where you look at. Um, very rarely I do total, uh, total thyroidectomy. The, the second gentleman I discussed, because uh, the cancer on the scan was going through the thyroid gland and the straps, we ended up doing a total thyroidectomy, but uh, surprisingly, his uh, thyroid gland was not involved. So the pickup rate is low, as I would recommend um, for gross destruction and extra laryngeal uh, extension, I would recommend doing the unilateral lobe, the ipsilateral lobe to the disease. And that has implications, however. You know, you have to think about hypothyroidism, uh, especially even if you preserve a half of the thyroid gland, uh, quite often, these patients uh, become hypothyroid uh, following radiotherapy, post-operative radiation. So you have to keep an eye on your TFTs, especially when they come to the clinic to see you a month after the, uh, their irradiation. You have to make sure either yourself or the GP checks their TFTs because that's uh, very important with regards to uh, healing, recovery from radiation, and also swollen. And the last question... After total laryngectomy, what is best time to start uh, speech rehabilitation? So almost all patients, I mean, everyone that I know of, uh, will get post operative radiation as a minimum. Some people will get chemotherapy as well. So um, you do want to, I, I, our speech and language therapy uh, colleagues get involved with them while they're on the ward. And if they pass their barium swallow, they swallow a contrast in day seven or day 10, depending on what you want to do it. Um, then we uh, they insert the valve. Uh, so the valve they leave the ward uh, with the valve, the speaking valve, and they and they start uh, practicing immediately. Um, you find quite often that following irradiation, the valve does not become as good, and they have to change it following completion of irradiation. Uh, but I think speech uh, rehabilitation should start as soon as possible either through a valve, uh, either through esophageal speech, or even through uh, an electrolarynx. The next question, how do you manage advanced laryngeal cancer invading the lumen of the trachea seen by bronchoscopy? Uh, so that's difficult when the, when the disease is, quite, is, is going very inferiorly because you have to go down. And the problem by going down is that, uh, you know, anything below a level, you know, fourth, fifth, ring, you have to do a tracheal resection, which means you're going to have to uh, do um, a, a mediastinal stoma. You have to resect bone. Uh, 
And these stomas, I haven't, I have, I've never done one, but from speaking to colleagues, they're very difficult to manage. They get a lot of crusting uh, and uh, patients struggle. But um, quite often, um, you just have to pull up the disease. So there's a question from Mr. Shaquille that's come in. Can you please comment on primary versus secondary T puncture? So uh, for, for um, T puncture, I, I always do it, and most people will do it for primary laryngectomy. In the salvage setting, uh, it's a slightly controversial because if you have a fistula, you know, the fistulization rate increases dramatically uh, in the salvage setting from 20 to like 50%, even in some series up to 75%. So if you have a fistula, especially if you haven't done a flap, uh, then the fistula, the saliva could run into the, uh, if, you, and if you, and you've done a puncture, then the, fist, the saliva could run into your, into your trachea, and then the patient will have problems with aspiration and pneumonia. So um, that's an argument for not doing the, the puncture primarily in the, in, the, in the salvage setting. And I, I tend to do the same. I don't do, I don't do a puncture primarily in the salvage setting. So I would wait uh, for them to finish, um, uh, to come back and start considering in about two to three months after, after they finish their, um, after, they, they, after, treatment, after surgery. In the meantime, they can have an electro uh, larynx, cervix, or trisophageal speech. Um, does that answer the question? Mr. Shaquille, I think it does. Uh, yes, thank you. And just a point, uh, here we do uh, insert a feeding tube through the initial puncture. So in the first uh, 12 days, they are feeding through that puncture hole, and then you replace it with a valve, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in Aberdeen, that's what we do. Uh, in other places that I've worked, uh, they some people insert the valve primarily, and they put a nasogastric tube instead of a stomogastric tube. Problem with the nasogastric is that is that first of all, it's very uh, uncomfortable for the patient because you know they have a, especially if they fail their their swallow test, they're stuck with this tube. Uh, and the other problem with that is that uh, they there's a theory. I mean, I don't think it's never been proven, like with most things in surgery, that having the nasogastric tube tube through the through the suture repair could predispose to problems with a suture repair. Um, the other option, the other point, the other way to, to overcome this is to do a, to do a rig, a gastrostomy tube for these patients. Uh, yeah, this is what we do in Aberdeen, but most people are moving away from this. Uh, they're putting primarily, they put a valve, a speaking valve primarily, rather than a, a stomach gastric tube. I don't know what, Jay, Jay what do you do in uh, Dundee? Do you put a valve up uh, front or you do a stomach gastric PD? I, I'm a big fan of uh, primary valve. Uh, and you are. Um, and uh, it very much depends upon the tissue in the bottom of it. Actually, if you think it's fully vascularized, there's no previous wild field radiation, and then uh, you could consider um, speech valve. Um, yeah. uh, even with the flaps, uh, I do put the primary speech valve, yeah. uh, as long as uh, you think the vascularity is good. Uh, the second thing is, and I mean, the uh, I mean, all because of the uh, reconstructive procedures and the position of the valve will change in three, four months' time. That might make the um, valve change a bit uh, challenging uh, in future. That's one uh, is the one, uh, argument. That's why they say, why don't you do it three months later uh, where you know all the healing process completed. Uh, exactly, you can uh, place your, you design your stoma and also sorry, a TEP puncture that will be useful for life. Um, there are arguments uh, for and against. Uh, Ian Nixon he is there actually, or Sam is there. Um, can I can I quickly say something from someone who looks after uh, people's voice and uh, etc. It's a part of my job. Uh, I sometimes have to look after patients as well who do not have a larynx. And, and it is vitally important that they speak as they wake up or in the early post-operative days for their psychological uh, uh, health. So when possible, where possible, it is most highly recommended that the valve 
is there, uh, 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 primarily there. G and I trained in the same place. So we were always putting valve on the same day, same time of surgery. But there are situations I understand when you can't put a valve in. But not putting a valve in always causes a lot of complications afterwards. And also depends on who is putting the valve in afterwards for a second through a secondary puncture. Thank you. Just wanted to add this bit. Thank you. Um, Panas, there's one more question. Um, can you share your personal experience regarding partial laryngectomy, especially outcome-wise? Well, sorry, I'm, I'm, I missed that. Uh, personal experience regarding? Uh, partial laryngectomy. Partial laryngectomy, yes. Yeah, so uh, I've, only, I've only been involved in two cases. Uh, I think in Scotland, we don't do it that much. Uh, we... We tend to get in, in even America. I only saw one case uh, that I was involved, and uh, it's interesting. It was a salvage uh, case, uh, and the patient failed and had a laryngectomy within a month. Actually, so the problem with a partial laryngectomy in the in the in the salvage setting is that it's very difficult to get good margins. Even if you get good margins, then um, the function of the larynx is really poor because this is a larynx that's been irradiated before. So um, from, from what I've seen, from what I've heard, most people end up having either a, a dysfunctional larynx or a larynx left with cancer, and they end up having a total object in the future. It's quite popular. Uh, it used to be very popular in this country in the past, uh, prior to the advent of uh, organ preservation techniques, uh, but um, in the primary setting, but uh, I, had, I don't have much experience in that. So... Uh, I cannot really speak. I'm sure uh, Sam or Ujai or maybe Ian has, has done a few of these, but I haven't done that many. Uh, I mean, that the, as Pana says, the gold standard is total laryngectomy for uh, salvage treatment. However, yeah. um, if you think if the tumor is like T1 or T2 uh, involving the vocal cords uh, more on the one side, not involving the correct or right joint, a uh, transfer later a uh, is actually still considered as a partial laryngectomy. This is endoluminal partial laryngectomy. That's actually been proven uh, as good as total laryngectomy. It's again a systematic review and meta analysis by uh, Professor Pallavi, uh, which showed uh, partial laryngectomy, particularly with the uh, laser, uh, is a good option. But we are talking about two types of partial laryngectomy. One is endoluminal and laser. The other one is open partial laryngectomy, which is very popular in Europe as well. That again, uh, they do provide good results, but to provide a good results, you should uh, be in a center which performs the procedure uh, in a significant amount. So they have a good state, which is actually unique. The second one is rehabilitation and the patient mindset and also geographical area in terms of further follow-up and treatment. Uh, so it, it is not a bad option. I would particularly uh, advise that, uh, particularly for uh, certain countries. But for UK, uh, I would advise a transfer of laser partial laryngectomy. We have, uh, we had three patients, um, which were kind of, or uh, we gave option of total laryngectomy as well as a transfer of laser partial uh, which We will see one of this in my talk at the end of it. Um, yeah, I hope that answers. I think um, Mr. Nixon is not here. Anyway, that's good. Uh, we are doing very well. I think Sam is, has got something uh, to say. I agree. I think I think Panas, uh, JD, you guys are all saying the absolutely right things. Partial laryngectomy hasn't quite taken up. That's the surgical open, etc. But endolaryngeal laser partial laryngectomy it can work. Now, I, I want to just quickly say to these all of you young people out there. When you are setting up a big center, head and neck center, set this center with three teams, resection team, reconstruction team, and rehabilitation team. These three R's, and all these three R's need surgeons. So you need a fantastic, very active laryngology rehabilitation setup to be able to uh, do partial laryngectomy and that kind of procedures. Thank you. Brilliant, that's fantastic. I think we are doing very well, so we'll have a at 20 minutes uh, coffee break. Um, we'll be back at uh, 20 past 11. Um, we have uh, two more uh, speakers. Thank you.